this is truly my way of getting the last say. Um, I usually would start out by um, saying thank you for the opportunity to speak here, but since I gave myself this opportunity, I'm not really sure what to say at this moment. All right, so uh, first off, I just wanted to say that this uh, conference has, for me has been a wonderful experience. It's been a lot of stress uh, and it's been, like we've talked about, it's been four or five years in the making. Uh, so I'm very happy to be up here and to be able to talk about the culmination of, of this. And I feel like we've had a really good experience. We've heard from a lot of things and hopefully I can kind of tie some of those loose ends together so we can talk about, you know, why I, think that being a curious clinician is what the world needs right now. Why I feel like we need to be focusing more on our curiosity and less on all the other garbage that's going on around in the world. Okay. And again, I don't have anything to disclose, but I wanna thank you all for your contributions. We couldn't do this without everyone coming, and I hope to continue to meet more of you and talk to you in the years that come when I get to sit in the seats with you more than I did this year. So the um, Omnisurgical Medical Society, this is the 77th year that we've been doing this. We've had thousands of medical providers who have come here to learn the latest advances in medicine, healthcare, hundreds of speakers from across the country and even across the world have come to share their passions. Uh, I remember kind of feeling the weight as we had a meeting with Dr. Dr. Adamako, who was the board uh, president, or who was the president last year, and meeting with the board. We had to make some tough decisions to cancel the, the conference a couple of years ago, and then last year we had to move up that, uh, we had to move back to the fall, which was kind of a new experience. And, for those of you who came, thank you very much for, for supporting us in that. It was a very tough decision. I will say it was really fun making those podcasts that we did in the off year. So if you haven't heard the we were uh, the County Medical, uh, the Ogden Surgical Medical Society podcast that we made, take a list of them. They're really interesting. We have some great interviews with some local and uh, national healthcare leaders. And so that was a lot of uh, fun. I'd encourage you to listen to those. We're still planning on doing more of those in the future. I just couldn't make any more while I was planning for this. Maybe I'll have a few minutes after this conference and we'll start that up again. All right, so first off though, I'd say I'm always invigorated after these conferences. It was very fun to hear uh, how the different speakers, and I'm not gonna name all of them, but how they really tied into the theme of this meeting. If we remember, we, we heard from Amy Herman on Tuesday and talking about um, finding patterns in, the, in fine art and how that can inform us in our own uh, lives. I love seeing the patterns in other fields and how they affect us. And I don't think anyone exemplifies curiosity better than, than Dr. Dunn, who came and talked about how uh, just looking in the small, in anywhere, um, you find a whole world of, of microbiology. And I, I don't know about you, but I, um, I'm a little more worried about my pillow now than I used to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but that was a ton of fun. And I just loved the curiosity that was emanating from him. Uh, Dr. Seeger, who talked to us about motivation research and how she made a whole career and a live, live, livelihood after asking one more question. Why is it that my patients who know that exercise is good for them, why did they stop? And she's turned that one question into a whole career. Uh, and, and it's just been really incredible, all of our other speakers. I mean, talking about what this morning when we heard from Dr. Clark and, and the, the pictures and the video of someone uh, without a hand being able to feel, feel his wife again. Like that was, I mean, that was moving, but it just got me reinvigorated and excited about medicine. And that's really what this meeting's all about, is keeping us excited. And I think the reason you all come back is the reason I come back, and that's because we're curious. We enjoy medicine, we enjoy our patients, we enjoy learning about it. Uh, but I also need to acknowledge that it's been a bad few years. I, I mean, not, I know it's not just me, I know it's a lot of you. We've had some rough times, and I want to address that. Uh, because I think that plays a role here. 
Um, even before the pandemic, I know I was struggling with my insecurities as a physician. Uh, how many times do you have patients who, you know, despite your best efforts, they continue to get worse or they come in and they want an answer, they're suffering, uh, and you just don't have an answer for them. It makes me feel inadequate. It makes me feel sad. There's no treatment that I have. And so I, I think we really need to have to, uh, to understand that we're really working in an extremely complex environment and an extremely complex uh, industry. And I think uh, our, our last president said it, uh, President Trump said it best when he said, nobody knew healthcare could be so complicated. And, and I, I feel that way too. Um, it, it's, been a, it's been a rough go. This reminds me, I, I, when I was thinking about this, it re, I was reminded of this quote that I heard from uh, one of our previous Ogden Surgical Medical speakers, Dr. Brent James, and he was quoting uh, Dr. Lawrence Henderson, who's a Harvard professor, who said, the year 1912 was a very special year in medicine. This was the first time in human history where a random patient with a random disease uh, had a more than a 50% chance of actually benefiting from that encounter. So it, that led me to think of two important questions. Like one, number one, why were people seeing physicians before 1912 and what changed, right? So in, if you look at the numbers, I mean, he wasn't wrong there. Uh, if you look at from the 1912 up to, to where we are now, our life expectancy has more than doubled. Uh, Dr. Moore was just talking about some of the public health changes that have allowed this to happen. So before that, why would anyone actually see a physician? And I think that comes down to mostly, and we're not going to spend too much time on this, but mostly patients required someone who would listen to them and show an interest in them when everybody else kind of took them for dead or, 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 or heading that way. And a physician would sit with the patient, listen to their story, try to understand them, and do their best to give some sort of prognosis of what was likely to happen, even if they couldn't do anything. And so that's a value. That's a value to the patient, and that's why they see you. But, the, but our medical uh, industry, us as physicians, nurses, our whole industry didn't stop there. If we would have stopped there, we would still be in the same spot. We, we continued on, and it was through works of people who asked the next question, who weren't satisfied with that feeling of inadequacy, who took it another step and said, why is this patient dying? What can I do to fix this? What can I do to make this person's life a little better? Asking that other question, showing curiosity in the patient, but also in the science of medicine is what allowed us to continue to develop and become the, 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 the group that we are today, where we can actually use fairly high levels of, of medicine, where we started out with just asking the question, how do people get sick? I mean, it was only in 1890 what we decided that, you know, there might be such a thing as, a, as some sort of bacteria or, or, or some sort of organism that causes infectious disease. But now, uh, we're all the way to having vaccines uh, that are developed within about a year's time. We have uh, antibiotics that treat the majority of infectious diseases out there. Think of what we've come and what we've done, and that took people being curious and asking the next uh, question. One of my uh, earliest role models in medicine is Dr. Willem Kolff. Dr. Kolff is a, a faculty emeritus at the University of Utah, and he is one of the reasons I ended up getting into bioengineering. Every day as a student, I would walk by, uh, uh, actually, it was, I think it was this display right here that showed some of his inventions. So he is credited with making the first artificial kidney, which morphed into dialysis today, uh, oxygen, uh, mem uh, heart lung machines and even the first artificial hearts and and I was 
interested in him, and I want to quote from his obituary in the New York Times. He sa it says here about Dr. Kolf that as a young physician at the University of Gron Groningen in the Netherlands in 1938, Dr. Kolf watched a young man die a slow, agonizing death from temporary kidney failure. He reasoned that if he could find a way to remove the toxic waste products that build up in the blood of such patients, he could keep them alive until their kidneys rebounded. For the first experiment, Dr. Cole filled sausage casings with blood, expelled the air, added a kidney waste product called urea, and agitated the contraption in a bath of salt water. The casings were semi-permeable. Small molecules of urea passed through the membrane, while larger blood molecules couldn't pass through. In five minutes, all the urea had moved into the salt water. The concept for building an artificial kidney was born. So he continued his designs at, during uh, the Nazi area, and he actually left the Netherlands because he refused to work with uh, other, uh, the Nazi sympathizers that were running his hospital. And not being content with that life, he ended up coming to America, worked in Cleveland for a while before coming to Salt Lake, where he went to develop treatments that saved hundreds of thousands of lives um, with the membrane oxygenator, like I mentioned, and the artificial heart, which was first implanted not far from here in Salt Lake City in 1981. I love this quote of his that he used to say, if a man can grow a heart, I can build one, right? Uh, what kind of, what, do we have that kind of thinking in, in nowadays? I only met Dr. Koff once, and he has subsequently passed away while I was in medical school. It was a very, you know, I still remember the meeting very fondly. I doubt he had much memory of it. He was quite old by then, and I was just a pre-med student. Um, but interestingly, he, we had kind of reverse careers. He came from the Cleveland Clinic to the University of Utah, and I came, went from the University of Utah to the Cleveland Clinic where I studied uh, medicine. And I, uh, I'm not here just kind of bragging about my, my history here. It's actually an interesting program. Uh, our school has 32 students a year. It's a very small school. We were in for five years, and the idea was to train what are called physician investigators, or physicians that would work in practice, come up with questions, and then try to figure out ways to answer those questions. And that's kind of the idea that I want to, I'm trying to imply to you today. It was also during medical school that I read probably the most influential medical article of my career to this date. And that I want to share a little bit about that. Uh, this article uh, was written by uh, Dr. Faith Fitzgerald in 1999. She was the dean of the UC Davis School of Medicine. and. Um, she was asked to write an article identifying what, uh, what characteristic makes for the best physician. She was good at training medical students, and she wa they want to know of what characteristic of her medical students ended up making for the best physicians. And as you might guess by the title, the, the title of the uh, article, uh, she chose curiosity. She defined curiosity as a primal wonderment that stimulates exploration, engages both imagination. She describes this as con uh, conceiving of alternate explanations for a new phenomena, and intelligence, mapping out the best way to determine which explanation is likeliest. So both intelligence and imagination combined are curiosity and are critical to the humanities and science and their natural combination, which we call medicine. So Dr. Fitzgerald gave an example of this. She writes a story about rounding in her hospital and trying to prove this point of being engaged and interested in your patients. And she describes an, a, a story once when she was rounding with the group of residents and she asked the intern to choose the most boring patient on the list for them to go round on next. The resident picked an older lady who was evicted from her apartment and was basically admitted because she had nowhere else to go. And there was nothing really surprising, interesting, or at all uh, special about this patient. Uh, no medical issues, no nothing. So Dr. Fitzgerald admits that she was a little nervous with this. She felt like she, this might kind of smack her back in the face after that. But she was persistent and started asking some questions. She said, 
how long have you lived in San Francisco? Remember, she's in UC, uh, UC Davis. How long have you lived in San Francisco? Years and years, she said. Where was she? Was she here for the earthquake, the famous earthquake in San Francisco? No, no, she came much after. All right, well, I can't go down that avenue. Where did she come from? Ireland. When did she come? 1912. Has nothing to do with the 1912 we talked about earlier. It just was a coincidence. But 1912. Had she ever been to a hospital before? Once before. What happened? How did you do that? Well, she had broken her arm. How did she break her arm? Uh, a trunk fell on it. A trunk? Yeah, yeah, a trunk. What kind of trunk? A steamer trunk. How did that happen? Well, I was on a boat and it lurched. The boat, yeah, the boat that took me from Ireland to America. What was the... What was, why did the boat, boat lurch? It hit the iceberg. Ah, okay, now she's starting to think. What was the name of that boat? Oh, it was the Titanic. The most boring person in the hospital is a Titanic survivor. How many Titanic survivors have you not seen? Right? Um, and so this is just kind of a, a friendly reminder. Showing curiosity in our patients invigorates us, it invigorates the patients. It's something we should always be doing. Uh, working in sports medicine, I often get to listen as patients tell me how they became injured. It's one of the reasons I got into the field. Uh, it's kind of like the medical equivalent of watching fail videos that you see on the internet, um, except I get to hear about them. And the patients, they'll tell me how they did these injuries, and you'd think they'd be so distraught and sad about it, but they actually are smiling. Even if they're in a lot of pain, they'll smile and they'll go, I just didn't quite make that full backflip, or I slipped on the ice while I was walking my dog. They, they, there's the pain and the treatment needs to happen, but just sharing their story creates a bond between the two of us, and both of us end up smiling. We eventually have to treat the problem, but there's that connection is made. That connection that oftentimes it gets harder and harder in the work that we're doing because we have less time with our patients. We have a computer that's often between us and the patient. There's so many more and more obstacles. Insurance companies that come between us and the patient. We, we've talked about all those. They're the things that frustrate us about our job. I just want us to remember that the reason we got into medicine, the pure aspect of it, is that one-on-one -on -one connection, hearing the story, talking to people. This is my favorite place to practice medicine. Um, for a few of you in here have worked here. This is outside the old clinic at Snow Basin Ski Resort. It was a tiny wooden shack that was very drafty, full of bugs and mice, and uh, we practiced medicine there for years. It was my favorite place in the world because I only ended up seeing four to eight patients a ski day, and we would just sit in there. They'd tell me how they got injured. I'd make them hot chocolate. We'd, I, they, we didn't have a, hundred, a lot of staff. It was just me and one other person. And then in the end, we didn't even have a way for them to go home, so I had to put them on sleds and, and walk across the ski route that's the ski run just to get them to their car. It creates an undeniable bond and patients will often tell me this is the best medical experience I've ever had. Not a brag, it was just having that one-on-one -on -one time with the patient that made this a wonderful experience. I didn't have the resources that would make me happy. I, didn't, I barely had a working x-ray machine. It was, I, I, I had myself, the patient, and our time and that's really what made this the most enjoyable place we don't practice in that clinic anymore it's a little busier but still still one of my favorite things to do okay so <clears throat> when i another aspect of being in cleveland when i was in medical school that I, we've talked about kind of that patient patient interaction uh, there's another part of the curiosity that we need to pay attention to, and that's our intellectual curiosity that we have in the field. If we just wanted to talk to people, we would have become reporters or, um, or, or, or those guys on the radio who interview people. Or There's a million jobs where you get to talk to people. We also have this interest in the science of medicine. And one of my favorite things to do during medical school was to go to the annual Cleveland Clinic Innovation Summit. 
This is an innovation summit they have every year, uh, multi-specialty like our group is, and every year they present the, to the national attention, this gets national press every year, the top 10 new innovations that have hit in the last year. Um, so I thought, I, at first I'm like, I'm gonna just do this and I'll make my own top 10 up. I realize that's a little harder than I thought, but I am gonna talk to you about a few of the ones that they came up with and a few of my own. Uh, just because I think this is really interesting to just think about. We're not gonna spend as much time, but really quickly, one of the top 10 innovations they reported was the new next generation of mRNA vaccines. More rapid and cost effective and more simple to manufacture, new mRNA vaccines have already drastically changed life on this planet. Without further, with further work and ingenuity, there may be no limit to what these vaccines are capable of and include much range, broader range of infectious diseases than we already cover and potentially even cancers. Um, uh, one of our, our previous speakers, Dr. Sisk, and I were talking about the work in early clinical trials in breast cancer vaccines that are, on the, that are being tested as we speak. So. I read an article about this in Scientific American. It was mostly lazy doctors who developed it. So the comment was that the, the article in Scientific America about mRNA vaccines, I recommend everyone looks that up. I'm going to go look that up afterwards. But he mentioned that uh, a lot of our female physicians are the ones who uh, develop, were behind the development of this. I did not know that, and I will have to go look that up. Thank you. Um, another uh, topic is this inclacerin. Uh, I don't know as much about this, but it, is, it, it did intrigue me. This is a new treatment for the reduction of LDL, uh, and it basically, the comment on this is cardiovascular disease has long been a leading cause of death in our patients. Inclacerin is a new medication to lower LDL and works differently than statin medications, allowing it to be used in individuals who already have failed or are already on a max dose of statins. Even better, it's a twice a year infusion, so it kind of helps eliminate noncompliance in patients, and that was one of the problems we have with statin medications. Another one, I try to give a little variety of different things here. PSMA targeted therapy in prostate cancer. Uh, most commonly diagnosed cancer for men with over 200,000 diagnoses a year. Diagnoses and staging of the cancer have been difficult even with advanced imaging. Prostate-specific membrane antigen, PSMA, is a radio tracer used along with other tracers which significantly increases the accuracy of PET scans in identifying the location and the extent of disease. So, I mean, that, there's just so many different advances in medicine. Uh, brexinolone. brexinolone. Uh, it's an IV infusion for the treatment of postpartum depression. I personally have seen way too many uh, cases of postpartum depression. It's one of the things I hate to see the most, how a new family can be devastated early on by, by this disease and how it can affect the relationship between mother and newborn child. This is a devastating disease that we have uh, poor information and poor treatments for, so I'm extremely excited about this. Uh, Child uh, postpartum depression rates are very high, and we are likely underestimating the disease burden. But with this new medication, there is showing some promise in potentially decreasing that burden. It's a one-time infusion that can be given at the time of delivery, and, and should and last throughout the early postpartum phase. All right, some of you may be more familiar with this one, AI-assisted documentation. This is happening in our neighborhood right now. I know several physicians who are already using this. Basically, a, a, a system where you talk into a microphone and the computer transcribes your, your discussion into a actual usable note. Um, right now, it's early, and it sounds, I, from the ones people I've talked to, they oftentimes have to have someone go through and clean it up, but the promise is there. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would love to not have to write notes anymore. Uh, it's, and I look forward to seeing how this develops over time. I imagine it will someday become the standard. All right, predictive analytics for hypertension. The last one we'll talk about. Uh, this is another machine learning type thing where uh, 
the, the pro computer algorithms will look through a patient's medical record, look for risk factors for hypertension, and make recommendations based on uh, genetic information, lab tests, um, demographics, about which medications for her blood pressure will work better than others. This isn't just limited to hypertension. You could think about this being used for any number of things. We were joking today about how much we all love our electronic medical record system. Uh -huh. It's about time that we actually make it start working for us instead of us working for it. And this is one way we can start moving that way. If you can have an assistant, a digital assistant that says, hey, consider this treatment. This may be your best bet. Um, this is where, this is how physicians, this is how medicine and, uh, and technology works together well. So there are a bunch of, there are a number of other technology we can talk about. I purposely left off the, the, the artificial hand that we talked about today because how am I going to compete with what we were watching this morning? There's, think about this. Back in 1912, would any of these things have ever been thought of or considered? All right. Even when I, I, I don't consider myself all that old, but even when I was in medical school, none of this stuff was even on the horizon. But the, the, the seeds of it were. The seeds of it were. The research was being done that led up to this. And that's how medicine is. It's not just one big jump. It's a lot of tiny little steps. But the tiny steps take a lot of people doing a lot of work to do that. And we need to, sh we need to respect them. And more importantly, we need to be a part of that ourselves. I want to kind of transition a little here. This being up here gives me the chance to be on a soapbox a little bit, so you get to hear a little bit about my, uh, my complaining now. I will argue there is a downside to all this improvement, all this progress, all this technological advance. Nowadays, it's not uncommon for patients to expect you to do miracles, to patients to say, I have this problem, fix me. You know, how, how many times have you, uh, how many times have you uh, just asked, you, you have a patient who comes in in front of you who you know you, they, you can't do anything about and they just listen to you talk and just wait there and say, what are you going to do to fix it? How are you going to fix me? What, uh, or, the, you know, they get, you, you've been spending, how many times have you had, you've been spending hours fight, trying to fight insurances or, or find new treatments or research for them only for them never to come back for their follow-up appointments? How many times do you need to provide high quality, intense care only for a patient to complain about a copay, right? We're somewhat the victims of our own success or the success of our forebears. Uh, I like this quote by uh, uh, the author Ian Morrison. He was talking about his own experiences. He said, uh, in Glasgow where I was born, death was seemed as, it seemed imminent. In Canada where I trained, it was thought to be inevitable. In California where I live now, it's considered optional. I feel like I run into this every single day. <clears throat> Think back to the times when you went to Herculean efforts for a patient and kind of remember that sort of thing. Now, patients are expecting us now to be heroes, to perform miracles, and this pandemic has not changed that, right? I mean, literally, there are signs in front of the hospitals of this community that say, heroes work here, healthcare heroes. Patients will come up and, and thank you for the, the miracles uh, that you perform. This mindset is kind of everyday, kind of normalized now. Um, and I cringe a little bit when I hear healthcare workers described as heroes, right? Personally, I'm gonna be very, I need to be careful here. I think you are all amazing. I love the work that you do. I, I think I am in awe of the, the, the work that's done in this community. And I think the best healthcare in the world is provided right here. But I think the word hero is a, mis, a misservice, a disservice to us and the wrong word. Uh, with, uh, 
with uh, miracles, the same thing. So what I, it really kind of depends on, on, on the definition uh, of what we could say. For me, when I think of the word miracle, I think the miracle is something that good that occurs, usually rapidly against any reasonable expectation that it would happen or a hero uh, that, that, and a hero or heroine is the person who puts themselves at risk, combating adversity, usually going above and beyond what is socially expected of them. In both of those words, hero, miracle, there's this inherent implication that society or the system has failed, thus requiring somebody or something to go above and beyond what society could reasonably ask them to do. This is why I cringe when I see signs that say, you know, healthcare heroes all over the place. They're out everywhere. Everybody is looking for us to become a healthcare hero. Here's a few other examples. This is in New York City. They've changed the whole street to become to healthcare hero way. This is the University of Utah Hospital in our own community. Um, closer to home, Davis Hospital. Again, I'm not critiquing the hospitals. I think I'll get to my point here in just a second. There's a McKD hospital where they hung up a huge flag um, during the pandemic to, to try to celebrate the heroes that are working there, given the same honors that are given to uh, military personnel. Uh, Ogden Regional, where different businesses brought in gifts for the healthcare workers because they didn't have any better way to show their gratitude. There's a problem with all this. When you call out someone as a hero, it places them on a pedestal and asks them to do something for you that you can't or won't do for yourself. Heroes are separated, isolated, and burdened with a duty that they didn't necessarily ask for. And when they fail, as all humans do, or even just appear to fail, it's easy to flip on them and see them as fallen. This picture got to me. I don't think I felt the same way about this picture as it was intended. Uh, I feel that, that, that feels isolating, um, even though it's meant to, to be encouraging. And so it creates this dichotomy where we have, uh, on the outside, people celebrating, throwing ticker tape parades, while on the inside, we have healthcare workers suffering, feeling isolated, alone, sometimes even aggressively abused. They're mentally burnt out, exhausted, isolated. It doesn't help that the scientific principles upon which our industry functions and upon which our society all benefit from, are, and the fact that we're now living twice as long as we used to, are being at under attack. All those scientific principles are under attack um, by people who claim to, to say that we're doing things wrong based on unsubstantiated anecdotes and false logic. The loudest voices are often those that believe that just because they thought a thought, that it must be true, and they lack the intellectual curiosity to test that out with their own, on its own merits. And because healthcare workers are just heroes and not people, it's easy to see them as one-sided or other and that allows for other mental uh, jumps, including violence. Uh, Dr. Berg presented on this earlier. Even before the pandemic, rises in violence, especially for healthcare workers, are, are, it's just exploding. When you see someone as not a person, but as a hero or other or something like that, your, your threshold for violence is different. We're not, treating each, we're not treating ourselves, and people are not treating us as, the, as human beings, as what we really are. Oftentimes with a hero, they'll just typically show up in a story, do their part, they get the, the, the credits of the movie roll, and then they get canonized for that one act. Their lives are boiled down to their acts of heroism. In the popular understanding of heroes, they don't have to wake up the next morning or do graveyard shifts with a patient that's already assaulted them. Okay? So I don't necessarily have a problem with the word hero. 
just when it's applied to medical workers, because I feel like it diminishes the feelings of isolation and frustration that are growing in our field. I feel that it's saying that I don't, uh, it, I feel that I can comfortably say that I don't see any of you here as heroes. Just in the same way, I don't see Hippocrates, Osler, Jenner, Kolf uh, as heroes, all right? We don't work miracles in medicine. We work in small steps with small achievements, often one patient at a time. We confront a challenge, and using our curiosity and compassion, it drives us to make those small achievements. Not as glamorous as a hero would look on the outside, but it's much more fulfilling on the inside. And because you're not a hero, none of you are heroes, you're not expected to work miracles, right? You're only asked to do your best, maintain your interest and curiosity in your patients and for your science, to keep learning at conferences like the one we're at right now, keep serving your patients, families, and your community. And you're not heroes, so you're not gonna, you don't have to be isolated. You don't have to be like Atlas, who alone had, was tasked with holding up the whole world. Increasingly, our workplaces feel lonely. And I feel luckier than most because I get to work with you know, 30 physicians in the residency at any given time. I have that opportunity. I know many of you don't get that opportunity. We live in an increasingly isolated workforce. There's just less collaboration and less talking. So I recommend we fight that trend. It's unnecessary, it's unproductive, and it's not helping at all. I recommend to fight this that we be active in our local societies and communities and with medical professionals in our area. Um, it protects you from burnout and gives you the satisfaction in your own work. I, want you, I recommend that you stay curious about the science of medicine and your patients. Try to learn something new every day. For this reason, I don't have a lot of words on my slides, but I am going to leave you with this challenge, something to do before the next conference. All right? So the challenge I leave you with is every day, try to do at least one of these following things. This isn't evidence-based. This is just me trying to think of how we can help our community. Number one, participate in your local or national medical societies. Weber County Medical Society, Davis County Medical Society, wherever you're coming from. Ogden Surgical Medical Society, great opportunities. Um, or on your national, with, that, with, it, with your specialty or other groups, there's so many opportunities to serve. Number two, come up with and answer a clinical question triggered by a patient encounter. Why didn't that uh, fluoxetine work in that patient? It works in most of my patients. That's a legitimate clinical question. You, and we have access at our fingertips to millions of papers that can help you answer those questions. And if you can't find the answer in those questions in, in, online, think you, maybe that's a question you can answer yourself or ask your colleagues, or start doing little projects in your own practice to try to answer that question yourself. Call and discuss a difficult case with a colleague or some a medical provider in another specialty. This is a dying thing. We used to just call each other all the time whenever we had a problem. And that interaction, like we talked about today with Dr. Sandwes um, and, and May, and, and my, sorry, uh, that's, we should be doing more of that. Call each other, talk to each other. None of us seem to be offended when someone calls us. Why do we feel like we're offending someone by calling them, all right? So I recommend doing that, even if it's for a little bit of thing. It's an excuse to talk to them. Or number four, try a small project in your own practice to improve the value for your patients and for your own satisfaction. Uh, the resident physicians did some great projects this year, and at times it was difficult for them, but it gave them insight into how they practice and what they're doing, and I think it made them better doctors for it. Try little projects, and then once you do those projects, bring them here. The nice thing about this society, we have a very low bar for our poster contest. Anybody who wants can present a poster. Literally, after these posters are done here, some of them will be hung up in the bathroom of our clinic, because in the bathroom of Porter Clinic, where we work, that's where they get the most reading. People sit in there and will read these and know these studies back and forth. You can bring any poster you want. Please bring them. We love having more. It doesn't have to just be uh, the undergraduate students and the residents. We want to hear what kind of work you're doing, because that invigorates the whole community and gives you more passion for your medicine. 
Through maintaining our curiosity and our patience in the science of medicine, we stay worthy of the real titles that we've earned. Not a hero, uh, but a doctor or a nurse, a PA, NP, ATC, or any of the other titles that we wear. To me, those titles are much better descriptors and much better honors than healthcare hero anyway. So I wanna thank you all again for coming to this year's conference. Um, maintain that curiosity. You're all wonderful. We're in the best, uh, best industry that there is. And I look forward to seeing you all again next year at next year's conference. And thank you again for coming.